Thank you for those readings. Excuse me a second. I'm just going to put this down here because I guarantee you if I live up there, I will forget. <laughs> uh, um, listen, I might just mention uh, one other thing uh, about, about the Forgetful Prints. Um, my wife did the illustrations, and they are lovely. Uh, it is um, a story about being adopted into God's family, about being a child of God, and remembering all the good things that that brings, because it is easy to forget. Um, Anglicare partnered with this book, and we uh, partnered in that way because of the great need for foster care families. Uh, every week in New South Wales, there are 100 children looking for some respite with a foster care family, whether that's for a few weeks or a few months or a bit longer. Every week in New South Wales, 100 children, only three children are placed into a family. What better place for a foster child than to be in the loving home of a Christian family who, who already understands what it means to be loved and adopted and brought into someone else's family, God's eternal family. So I'll just leave that with you uh, to ponder um, and happy to talk with you about that uh, later on if you like. It is a wonderful privilege to be here this morning representing Anglicare and being able to be part of the series of Joshua and speaking from Joshua chapter 2. It's a lovely chapter to read on this Mother's Day. Many churches around the world on Mother's Day are speaking from another part of the Bible, probably from uh, Proverbs 31. Um, not sure if you've read Proverbs 31 recently, but it is speaking there um, about a, a woman, um, and what a woman she is, can I just say. This, uh, this Wonder Woman in uh, Proverbs 31 describes her, and we develop this mental image of her in our minds. She, she uh, gets up before dawn, and she stays busy all into the, the early hours of the night. She has the looks of a movie star. She has the domestic, domestic abilities of a, of, a, of a master chef, the stamina of a world-class athlete, the intellect of a professor who's doing a PhD, uh, the tenacity of a political operative, the wisdom of a godly missionary, the sensitivity of Mother Teresa and the, uh, the spiritual formation and perhaps of the Virgin Mary herself, not to mention the business acumen of a Fortune 500 executive. It's, it's no wonder why so many mothers leave church on Mother's Day feeling so depressed <laughs> and so down. I mean, who? Who can live up to that kind of a standard? Can any of us live up to that perfection? Certainly a goal for us to uh, try and attain, all of us. But we all fall short. We are all in a, in a process of trying to become more and more like Jesus as, as best as we can by his spirit. Um, but if we're going to reach people with the gospel, we want to reach them where they are at, not where they, we, you know, some sort of lofty attainment of where we think they should be. And so, as I said, I'm pleased to be speaking from Joshua um, chapter 2, because I think if Jesus was here, he would probably speak along a similar lines from, from this passage on Mother's Day. I think he wouldn't just give a whole, you know, bunch of platitudes and nice poems on Mother's Day. I think he would leave the 99 and go after the one who is hurting and lost and perhaps in a little bit of hope, need of, need of hope. Um, perhaps it's the woman today who has never born children and the grief that that brings. Or the mother who, who birthed a child and loved him so much, like my mother did, um, then entrusted him to someone else to uh, raise that child. Um, perhaps it's the one who is parenting solo and is exhausted 
or the one who finds herself just losing all patience uh, too many times and lashing out unfairly. Whatever it is, on, on this Mother's Day, um, I'm hoping that the Lord will speak to each and every one of us at the point of our need in our moment. And Rahab's story does this as we look at Rahab the harlot, Rahab the harbourer, and, and Rahab the heroine. But I might pray um, before we begin. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that indeed you have loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, to adopt us into your family, where we can call you Father, where we can be your children and benefit in all the delights and privileges that brings. Father, this Mother's Day, will you speak to us through this passage where we are at? Give us ears to hear what you uh, know that we need to hear and give us the grace by your spirit um, so that our lives might be changed um, for them as we seek to live for Jesus. Amen. As you heard read in Joshua chapter 2, we meet here a lady with a reputation, a reputation that is far from spotless. She is quite popular with the men whose uh, caravans would stop on their journey uh, to or past Jericho. Everyone knew where her house was. The kids would walk past and point and laugh and snigger at the one who lived inside. Of the five times that uh, she is mentioned in Joshua, the five times that Rahab's name is mentioned, the word harlot or, or prostitute is placed right alongside her as if her reputation was glued to her, a reputation she just couldn't shake off. She was a woman who was involved in, for, for one reason or another, involved in this world of of sinful pleasure, and I don't need to describe that world. You, you can probably imagine what it would have been like for her. But nonetheless, involved in this work, in this role, and most likely to support her family. Uh, when her family members are listed in Joshua 2, verse 13, th there's no mention there of a husband or of children just her father and her mother, her brothers and, and sisters, possibly elderly parents, possibly younger siblings that she feels compelled uh, to support financially and, and physically to look after. Now, when the Israelite spies came to Jericho and came to her, her house at the beginning of the conquest of Canaan, these spies went to her house presumably not for a night of seduction, but an evening of safety and security. What better place to hide? And so she took them in. This harlot harboured these spies. Interestingly, when night fell, as she spoke to these uh, spies on the rooftop, she began to regale and, and, and tell them everything that she already knew about them. News of them, news of Israel, had made its way over the past 40 years to Jericho. And she didn't speak of what they had done for God. She didn't talk about all of you know, their amazing skills and their army that would have been quite significant by now. No, what struck this woman's heart was what the living God had done. What God was doing. What God had done for them and, and through them. And so she went up to the roof and this is what she said. I know that the Lord has given you this land. The Lord has given you this land. 
and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. And let me just, let me just read that last sentence um, one, again, just to just hear what she's saying here. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. Everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and earth below. Your God is God. Here are words spoken by one with a repentant heart, a, a trusting heart knowing that the living God is the one and only God. He is God of heaven and earth, and therefore he is God of me. And this really is my prayer for all women, everyone on, on, on Mother's Day, that each and every one of us will come to know that the Lord, the God of the Bible, is God, and that we come to him in repentance and faith. However, not only did this woman of Jericho uh, repent in the moment, in a sense, or have this sense in the moment when the spies were there, there's good evidence that she continued to place her faith in the living God. And in doing so, she not only harbored the spies, but she became a safe harbor for her family's future. She went to the spies on that, that evening and she asked them something. She said, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family. I know that you're coming to destroy us, but will you show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you? Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Now, the spies agreed, and uh, when the spies went on their way with the promise of returning, they told Rahab to do three things, just three things. Number one, tie a scarlet cord outside the window of your house. And so when we come to conquer the city, your home will be spared. We'll see the red scarlet cord. Your home will be spared. Number two, ensure your family remains inside the home and be ready. And number three, do not go back on your word. Don't turn against us. Now, while it's not the same, there's an, an echo here, isn't there, of what the Lord told Israel to do back in Egypt if they wanted their family to be saved and rescued. Paint the scarlet blood of your offering outside your home. Ensure your family remains inside and ready to leave. And do not go back on your word. Do not turn against the living God. And when Rahab said yes to these, uh, to the God of heaven, by, um, in a sense, expressing her faith and trust by tying this scarlet cord outside her window, an amazing thing happened. God in heaven knew about the coming cross, of which Rahab was unaware. The blood was shed on that cross before the foundation of the world. God saw that cross and the salvation that it freely offered and looked down on Rahab's faith and saved her, not with a scarlet 
cord, but with the red blood of his son. Here in Joshua 2, um, we see a celebration of her faith as she hangs this scarlet cord on the window so judgment wouldn't fall upon her. And it's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of salvation? A beautiful picture of salvation tucked away in this small chapter of the Old Testament. There's another small but interesting uh, insight we can garner from these uh, verses, just a few verses earlier in this story, when she took the spies up to the roof and she hid them under uh, stalks of flax. It says uh, she hid them under stalks of flax, which she had laid in, or, in order on her roof. Uh, what is flax, you might ask? Um, why was there flax on the roof? Why, were they, why was it so neatly ordered? Why was there so much of this flax that it could actually hide two men? In the ancient world, uh, flax, which is a plant, was gathered by industrious women and, and dried out and used for spinning and weaving. It was used to <clears throat> for, for its fibres to create linen and cloth and material. It's interesting um, that in Proverbs 31, the, the proverb I mentioned earlier, the Proverbs 31 uh, woman says that she seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. So is it possible that such a large quantity of this on the roof may indicate that Rahab was a wise and industrious woman, perhaps trying or maybe even already had just experienced a change in vocation to elevate herself above her station and follow after the living God? Possibly. And so here in this story so far, we see uh, Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute, Rahab the harbourer, not just of her spies, but of her family, her whole family. And I want us also to see Rahab the heroine. What happened to her? Whatever happened to Rahab? Well, a spoiler alert, uh, in Joshua chapter 6, we read this. We read that Joshua indeed spared Rahab with her family and all who belonged to her because of the fact that she hid the men uh, the spies, and it says there she lives, she lives among the Israelites to this day. So she and her family lived, and these foreigners became part of God's family, living with the Israelites. She lived, but whatever happened to her? The fact is that she's never mentioned of again until we get to Matthew chapter 1 in the New Testament, where we come to the genealogy of Jesus. And it's here I want you to see Rahab the heroine. What happened to her? Well, she lived among the Israelites and she fell in love. She fell in love with a prince by the name of Salmon. And God blessed their union with a son whose name was Boaz, who became in the book of Ruth known as the kinsman redeemer. So this former harlot of Jericho became the mother of Boaz, who became the husband of Ruth. And if you follow her genealogy as recorded for us in Matthew chapter 1, it leads us all the way to Jesus and all the way to the cross. It wasn't common, it wasn't common at all in, in the ancient world to list women uh, in a genealogy. But they are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. In fact, five women are mentioned. And one might think that if you, if you get to be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, then surely you, know, you must be some sort of virtuous woman. A Proverbs 31 woman. But a closer look reveals something quite different. 
Jesus is unashamed to have women of questionable repute in his family. In fact, he actually goes out of his way to point them out. In Jesus' genealogy listed there in Matthew, only, only fathers and sons are recorded except for these five exceptions, these five mothers. Number one, Rahab. She makes the list. So does Ruth, the Moabite Tess, who was raised uh, and born and raised in a pagan culture who worshipped other, other false gods. Tamar makes the list. She's mentioned. She entered into the royal bloodline of Jesus by disguising herself as a prostitute and seducing Judah to impregnate her because of the unjust way that she was treated by him. Then there's Bethsaida, who David stole from Uriah. She gets a mention. And so does, of course, Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, who became pregnant with him outside of marriage and whose claim to this miraculous conception was met with, well, you know, scepticism. Isn't that wonderful? People tend to conceal the more disgraceful events and disgraceful people in their family. Not Jesus. He chooses to highlight possibly the most scandalous five women in his lineage. You see, God, God weaves his grace throughout the Bible even through these list of ancestors. God loves to redeem sinners. He loves to produce something beautiful out of the broken. He delights in forgiving failures and providing hope for the hopeless. He loves to make foreigners and outcasts his children, bringing people in to be a special part of his eternal family and his forever kingdom. What a lovely message to have this Mother's Day. Let me pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that this story of Rahab has been kept and recorded for us in your word, in the Bible. We thank you that you love people like Rahab and so many others and us, sinners, in need of a saviour. Thank you that you raise us up well above our station so that we might be included in your family, known as your children, where we can call you Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.